Great, my name is Nishan Yazam. I'm the editor for the magazine called Ceasefire, and uh, I have been the editor for seven years now. And um, I'll be mostly talking about my experience over the last two years, um, based on my treatment of by the state uh, system. Um, I'd like to begin by mentioning uh, Jody ended his uh, talk by talking about Edward Said and quoted his uh, famous and very um, uh, great remark by uh, the late uh, Edward Said. And um, it's by remembering, the power of remembering and the necessity of remembering. And um, this week, uh, seven, year, seven years ago, uh, it was when the, uh, the attack on Iraq um, was launched. And it's also the uh, week when um, Rachel Corey, who is a, a US um, American uh, activist, was uh, bulldozed to death um, while, while trying to prevent um, a house in Rafa from being demolished by a, by a, a bulldozer. Um, this week, well, this month, after more than seven years, her parents have finally had the chance to have a hearing held to discuss uh, and to look at the incident of seven years after it took place. And I think it's good to just make sure we sustain the memory of uh, people like Rachel who gave their lives to, um, so that Palestine could be free, and I, I do believe they will be free. And um, <coughs> the same as for the Iraq, I think we should never forget that. Even though it's been years, we should keep the call for the truth to be taken out, and we should also be making sure that our government basically uh, pays the Iraqi people uh, back for all the suffering they have, I and mean, they can never really match it, because they, they need to um, start thinking seriously about reparations for all the, the, the years uh, after the, the, uh, the attack and before. So on to my own story. Um, I have been based in Ottoman for many years, uh, almost 14 years now. Uh, I was a student there, and then I became a member of staff. And in 2008, uh, while I've been working there, I got a call one morning uh, from somebody who was uh, working in the same building the guy as I am, uh, which was the main building of the university, uh, telling me that <coughs> they were worried because they, there was a lot of police um, outside my office. Uh, I was worried too, but my, my guess at the time was that there was a break-in or something of the sort, and I made my way specifically to, to see what was happening. Uh, uh, called the office and said I'll, I'll be there very shortly to try and assist the police. Uh, so you can imagine my surprise when I was arrested upon arrival by the, the, the same officers. I uh, was not told what was the, the reason behind my arrest. I was taken to the local police station uh, in Antwerp. I uh, was arrested in front of the entire of whoever was in the building that day. It's a big building. And, uh, you, know, you can imagine the sort of shock <coughs> when this is the last thing you expect. I was taken to the police station, it was um, you know, searched, um, put in a cell, uh, fingerprinted, you know, my DNA uh, details were taken. Um, also had uh, what they call footprinting, which is basically the same as fingerprinting, but really the um, It's actually a very, very lengthy procedure that takes about three hours, because they need to be really, really accurate. I've taken it, it's a lot more rigorous than that in the fingerprinting, but the fingerprints are for every single finger, it's not just the one, so the whole operation was about three, four hours, um, very unsettling. And it took about ten hours before I was asked a single question, uh, which is when I discovered the reason for the uh, for the arrest, which was the presence on my computer, in my office computer, of the document for the Al-Qaeda training manual. Um, I'll give a bit of context. I, I edit a magazine it's called Ceasefire, which is the main political and cultural journal uh, at the university. But it's it's fairly uh, it's a national publication. It's uh, sold all over the country and even abroad, and um, quite well established. And because of it, a lot of people come to me uh, quite often ask me for advice on things that have to do with um, their academic subjects, if it's to do with politics or economics or. Uh, and so forth. And one of my friends, Liz Lonsky, came to see me and he was thinking of doing a PhD in politics and asked me if I would help him draft his 
PhD proposal, and I said yes. And his PhD was going to be on the radical Islam and uh, Al Qaeda in particular, but other movements as well. And I said fine. And uh, as part of the US, started meeting up and discussing this topic. And he used to send me uh, the various um, documents he was reading, research materials. And the Al Qaeda training manual was one of them. And the reason, um, it's not the reason, the way he found it or the way he, he came across it was simply by um, looking on the reading list for one of his modules on terrorism. And the reading list had uh, some of the resources, the, of all places, the US Department of Justice website, which had under the documents there for researchers and scholars, the Al Qaeda training manuals, the declassified open source document that's available to the public. Anyone in this room can read it, anyone in the world can read it. Um, nothing against it. There's one sent to me, uh, along you know, dozens and dozens of documents I used to be consulting, mostly papers, academic papers. And that was the reason I was arrested. Um, as soon as I heard that that was the problem, I was relieved and I thought, that's fine, it's going to take five minutes. I'll explain the context, so we'll be able to verify for the Rizwan and they'll be able to verify the. Uh, the computer, you know, email exchanges and so on, and that will be the end of it. What happened instead was, um, as soon as I sort of established the scene and, you know, explained the circumstances, instead of releasing me um, and this one, who was also arrested, um, they instead spent six days trying to find other stuff to convict us for basically six days of just asking all sorts of questions about all sorts of irrelevant things um, to try and find something. That's how it became really obvious by the end of it because it was simply surreal sort of questioning. Um, in addition to my magazine, I also did things like photography and cartooning and it ended up being in this sort of very bizarre situations where I'd have, you know, A3 uh, blown up stuff in my classrooms and being asked to explain them and uh, having you know, pictures of just trees uh, that I took from the campus being asked to explain why I took pictures and the, the, one of the most bizarre and I think the most telling which is I think linked to um, my, the wider point I'll be making about this, the, the state actions and the, the terror of the state <coughs> is um, I was questioned at length for many hours, in total about 20 hours, uh, about my reading habits. And I do not mean the sort of things I read, but the fact I read in the first place. And the assumption was that uh, being an Arab and a Muslim, reading was some sort of very subversive, very uh, suspicious thing to do. 